Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Katie Cook. Uh, welcome to today's telehealth billing and reimbursement webinar, updates for 2019. Um, I am with Adirondack Health Institute and I oversee our telehealth project here in the North Country alongside Fort Drum Regional Health. I'm gonna share my screen here. And we're going to get started. We have a lot to cover today, so I'm going to try and get through the content in roughly 45 to 50 minutes, making sure to allow enough time to uh, have questions and um, all that good stuff. I'm just going to change the view here real quick. All right. Okay. Why is my screen up? There we go. All right, a couple of housekeeping items to get started. Uh, this webinar will, of course, be recorded for future access, and the links will be sent out later this week. Um, it will be archived on both the North Country Telehealth Partnership and AHI websites for access. We will also be putting this on HealthStream, which is our online learning management system for our district partners. If you would like to submit a question, you can do so through the question box on your GoToWebinar dashboard. All questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Um, I also attached three handouts to your GoToWebinar dashboard. One of the columns, it says have handouts. There's three handouts there. And those handouts are the new um, New York State Department of Health Medicaid Special Telehealth Update. One is a document with the draft regulations for OMH for telemental health services. And the final one is the current OASAS telepractice regulations. So feel free to click on those and download them for your reference. Next up, but just a quick disclaimer. Um, we have made every attempt to ensure the accuracy and reliability of the information today, but I just want to reiterate that some questions that might come through regarding state regulation may have to be deferred to the respective state agency. Um, we certainly don't want to provide our interpretation of state regulation, so if there is a question that I am unable to answer today, I will be confirming and following up with you um, within a week or two. So to get started, a brief agenda for today. We're gonna to start with a quick less than five minute telehealth review and billing definitions just to level set. We will then transition into talking a lot about Medicaid fee for service and the New York State Department of Health. Uh, they came out with a special telehealth update about three weeks ago. We'll then transition into talking about OASAS and OMH. We will do a review of Medicare. I did a webinar about this in December of 2018. And then lastly, we will be discussing third-party payers. Just some quick definitions so we're all on the same page. I know most of you on the line are aware of these, but we always refer to where the patient is located as the originating or spoke site and where the provider is located as the distant or hub site. You will see these terms used quite frequently throughout today's session. Additionally, there are several modalities of telehealth and telemedicine. Telehealth is really the overarching definition, with telemedicine being more narrowly focused on that live, two-way audiovisual communication or synchronous communication. Additional modalities include store and forward or asynchronous, remote patient monitoring, mHealth or mobile health, that's uh, smartphone apps, direct-to-consumer platforms like Doctor On Demand or Teladoc, and then lastly, provider to provider consults, which is most commonly seen with Project Echo. Some billing definitions. These are common modifiers that we are all aware of. We will be discussing throughout the session where these modifiers are applicable. So, of course, starting with the GT modifier, this is used to indicate that the visit uh, was conducted with video conferencing or synchronous technology. It is only for use with those services that are provided via synchronous telemedicine when modifier 95 cannot be used. The GQ modifier is used to indicate store and forward technology was used. The 95 modifier can only be appended to specific services covered by Medicaid 
and listed in Appendix P of the AMA's CPT Professional Edition 2018 Code Book. We won't be talking about what those specific codes are, but if your organization has the 2018 Code Book, you'll want to refer to Appendix P to see what those codes are that you would use the 95 modifier with. An additional modifier that we're going to touch more upon is the 25 modifier. This modifier indicates a significant, separately identifiable evaluation and management services by the same physician or other qualified healthcare professional on the same day as a procedure or other services. We will be talking about how this is applicable to telehealth in a little bit. And lastly, Place of Service Code of 02 was adopted by CMS several years ago that basically says a physician or practitioner used telehealth services from a distant site. So now we'll transition into Medicaid and the Department of Health. This new special telehealth update that was sent out to the masses several weeks ago is not a draft, nor is it open for public comment. This is a finalized document. So most exciting this year are the changes that you're going to see on the following slides highlighted in red. I would say that New York State Medicaid fee for service has the most comprehensive list of eligible telehealth or telemedicine providers for a government payer that I have seen. As you can see, this list is quite comprehensive. And in red, I've highlighted some of the newly added eligible providers, which include KSACs, credentialed by OASAS, residential health care facilities serving special needs populations, and early intervention program per providers pursuant to Article 25 of public health law. Some examples of sites of delivery, so eligible places where the patient can be located. The first part of this list uh, is the list that has been in fact for several years now, and it includes your Article 28 facilities, so your hospitals, nursing homes, uh, Article 40 facilities, which are hospice facilities, uh, Article 31 and 32 clinics, and then clinics licensed or certified under Article 16 of mental hygiene law, and there's an asterisk there for a reason. So Article 16 clinics are certified by OPWDD. OPWDD's telehealth regulations are in effect and refer back to Public Health Law Article 29G, so they actually align very closely with the regulations you're seeing right now for Medicaid. OPWDD is in final stages of developing an administrative directive memo to provide clinical and billing guidance for telehealth and this memo should be published soon. I don't have an exact date, but when I do get that administrative directive memo, I will be sending it out to all of you. So recently added to this list, which is the most exciting and positive direction that I've seen our state take, is that the member's place of residence located in New York State or other temporary location within or outside the state of New York is now eligible for telehealth services. This is really exciting and a really positive step for New York State to expand telehealth services. And for eligible sites for a provider or hub site, basically any secure location where that telehealth provider is located within the 50 United States or United States territories. So long as they are in maybe their private practice or their home, as long as they have a secure HIPAA compliant and encrypted connection, they are eligible to provide telehealth services. So now we're going to get a little bit into reimbursement and billing. So for the new update, with telemedicine, so that's your two-way live audio-visual encounter, if both the originating site where the patient is located and the distance site are part of the same provider billing entity, only one payment is going to be made and that payment needs to be billed by the originating site. So I've received a few questions on this, and how that will work is if they are part of the same billing entity, the originating site would not bill the administrative site facility fee, that Q3014 code. I know that's typically what originating sites have done in the past, but in this particular situation, if you are a part of the same billing entity, the originating site would bill for the professional fee using the appropriate CPT code and modifier. So that is an important change to note if this applies to you. For dual eligible patients, so Medicare and Medicaid, if Medicare covers the telehealth encounter, Medicaid will reimburse the patient's Part B coinsurance and or deductible 
to the extent permitted by state law. However, if Medicare does not cover that service, Medicaid will defer to Medicare's decision and also choose to not cover that service. Lastly, for Article 28 clinic originating sites, so an outpatient department or clinic, an emergency room that bills under ambulatory patient groups, the originating site may bill that Q3014 code, that's that administrative uh, site facility fee, through APGs to recoup those administrative expenses associated with the telemedicine encounter. We will be talking about exactly what that dollar amount is tied to that code in a little bit. This is where the 25 modifier may come in. So when a separate and distinct medical service unrelated to the telemedicine encounter is provided by a qualified practitioner at the patient site, the originating patient site may bill for that service in addition to the Q3014 and that new CPT code needs to be appended with the 25 modifier. This modifier has historically always been for an in-person visit, that hasn't changed. But a question did come up, um, what if there was two telemedicine visits for one patient on the same day? The take on the guidance that I've received is that this 25 modifier is meant to be submitted for an unrelated in-person service conducted in addition to the telehealth service. So if you were billing two different telehealth encounters for the same patient on the same day, you would not use the 25 modifier. You would bill each distinct telehealth service separately with the CPT code and GT or 95 modifier. And a major advancement in New York State that I'm really excited about is that federally qualified health centers can now act as distance sites and bill Medicaid at the PPS rate if they have if they do not bill ambulatory patient groups. So that's a distinction. If you are an FQHC on the line and you have opted into APGs, you would follow the billing guidance that I just discussed on the previous slide. If you have not opted into APGs, you can now act as a distance site provider. So this is really exciting. Additionally, when services are provided by telemedicine to a patient located at an FQHC originating site, the originating site can bill only the FQHC offsite services rate code, which is 4012. It's kind of the FQHC equivalent of Q3014. Additionally, if there is a separate and distinct medical service unrelated to the telemedicine encounter, the originating site can bill the PPS rate in addition to the 4012 code. Lastly, if a provider who is on site at an FQHC is providing services to a member who is in their place of residence or other temporary location, the FQHC should bill the off-site services rate code and report the applicable modifier on the procedure code line. So if you're an FQHC on the line, this is really exciting stuff, and this is a very important slide for you to take note of. For store and forward technology, uh, it is confirmed that store and forward in this case means provider to provider only and not patient to provider. This is a big difference from what Medicare has put forth for virtual visit codes that can be used and submitted by patients. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a little bit. So for store and forward technology, it includes videos and or digital images excluding radiology. And it just needs to be specific to the member's condition. Reimbursement will be made to the consulting distance site practitioner at a rate of 75% of the Medicaid fee for the service provided. This is an improvement from 50% previously, so they have increased the rate that they will reimburse for store and forward. And of course, when you're billing for these types of professional services, you would want to use the modifier GQ. Uh, keep in mind also, it is up to individual private insurance plans what they will cover regarding store and forward services. They wouldn't necessarily be required to cover patient to provider asynchronous technology. For remote patient monitoring, so Medi New York State Medicaid has said that medical conditions that can be treated or monitored by this methodology include CHS, diabetes, COPD, wound care, mental or behavioral health problems, and additional uh, modalities listed on the slide. It needs to be ordered and billed by a physician, 
nurse practitioner, or midwife with which the patient has entered into a substantial and ongoing relationship. It needs to be medically necessary and discontinued when the patient's condition is stable or controlled. Lastly, payment for remote patient monitoring while a member is receiving home health services through a CHA will only be made to that same CHA. Additionally, telehealth services provided by means of remote patient monitoring for Medicaid fee-for-service patients needs to be billed using CPT code 99091. A fee of $48 per month will be paid for this service. To bill for that, a minimum of 30 minutes per month must be spent collecting and interpreting the member's data. This fee is an increase from $32 previously, and providers are not to bill this code more than one time per member per month. A side note, federally qualified health centers that have opted out of APGs are unable to bill for RPM services at this time. Now we will be moving on to OASAS and OMH. So for OASAS, they call it telepractice. And telepractice services can be utilized for certain assessment and treatment services when treating the following disorders, substance use disorder, opioid use disorder, and gambling disorder. And this includes medication-assisted treatment. It is an optional means of service delivery to OASAS certified programs and providers that would like to request to use the service need to submit a plan and attestation to their regional office and to the OASAS Bureau of Certification. Upon acceptance of such attestation, OASAS will provide a written approval in addition to a designation on your operating certificate. Billing guidelines. Once the originating site has received approval from OASAS to provide telepractice, claims can be submitted for government approved APG rates and Medicaid managed care reimbursement. A big change here is that programs should consult the most recent Medicaid update, so what we just talked about, for information on billing, code modifiers, and any allowable additional fees, whether administrative or facility. For OASAS practitioners, they need to be licensed to practice in New York State, but can be physically located anywhere in the U.S. They also need to be enrolled in New York State Medicaid and be able to bill Medicaid. They also must be employed by the OASAS designated provider or have an executed contract or MOU to perform these types of services. All patients engaging in telepractice must have at least one in-person evaluation session with clinical staff prior to participation and a statement of informed consent. A side note for buprenorphine. Induction for buprenorphine requires a preliminary face-to-face -face evaluation by a Data 2000 waived prescribing professional. However, if a DEA approved practitioner is physically present with the patient, then the initial face-to-face -face evaluation indicated here in italics may be conducted via telepractice with the Data 2000 wave prescribing professional. This exception may support additional accessibility if a DAA practitioner has met their cap. Some valid services that can be billed by a telepractice include at the bottom admission assessments, direct transfers, psychosocial evaluations and mental health consultations, MAT and other services as approved. And next up, OMH. So the New York State Office of Mental Health has recently released draft regulations that are open for public comment. That public comment period, period is nearing the end. And it has really expanded the use of what they now call telemental health services. Previously, this was referred to as telepsychiatry. But now, if you've read through the draft guidance, everything has been changed to telemental health services. They have also expanded the use of these services beyond the clinic setting to now include assertive community treatment and personalized recovery-oriented services, teams, and or settings. Much like OASAS, a provider of services needs to get written approval from OMH before utilizing telemental health. And in that plan, there is a set of policies and procedures that are required, a technological guidance checklist, so on and so forth. So the following telemental health practitioners are eligible to provide these services. 
Previously, it was just a physician, psychiatrist, and a nurse practitioner in psychiatry. The list has been expanded to include licensed mental health counselors, psychologists, and social workers. The licensed mental health counselors, psychologists, and social workers must be located in New York State when providing services. However, the psychiatrist and nurse practitioner in psychiatry can be located anywhere in the U.S. One of the changes that has also been put into the draft regulation includes approval of telemental health services in ACT and PRO settings. So there are some additional, um, there's some additional guidance that's been put forth for use of telemental health services in these settings. So starting with the PRO setting, the telemental health services can only be delivered in a PRO setting, um, also in an ACT team by psychiatrists and nurse practitioners in psychiatry. So psychologists, mental health counselors, and social workers would not apply in, in this regard. These services can only be used for a limited period of time for both, not to exceed one year. However, if there is demonstration of a continued shortage in providers, that time frame can be extended, but not for more than one additional year. Additional changes include that the originating or spoke site is now anywhere the client is located in New York State or other temporary location within or outside New York State. So this change really flows in alignment with what DOH has put forth. They are really trying to align their guidance to make it um, streamlined for all. So an example of a temporary location outside of New York State would be um, maybe a college student who wants to keep a relationship with their therapist or their, their counselor, I apologize, or an extended visit out of state. Additionally, various mobile technologies will now be allowed. Examples of that include video, cell phones, and tablets. And lastly, pan, tilt, zoom, or PTZ cameras will no longer be a requirement within the regulation, but will remain within the guidance as a strong recommendation. Lastly, some uh, final changes to the guidance that have been put forth include that telemental health practitioners must display their license and current registration at their location so that it is clearly visible during a telemental health encounter and so that patients can have access to that information for their view. Additionally, if there is a patient under the age of 18, they may include staff that are qualified mental health professionals or other appropriate staff at the patient site to be in the room with the patient. Lastly, telemental health services shall not be used for purposes of ordering medication over objection, involuntary admissions, or for restraint or seclusion. Reimbursement wise, the patient site where the patient is admitted is authorized to bill Medicaid for telemental health services. There are just a few qualifying uh, pieces of information here that are important that are pretty self-explanatory. The person receiving services is present during the encounter. The distance site practitioner is not at the same site as the patient and that the telemental health practitioner is licensed in New York State, practicing within their scope, and is affiliated with the originating or spoke site facility. The originating or spoke site can bill for administrative expenses only when a telemental health service connection is being provided and a qualified mental health professional is not present with the patient at the time of the encounter. So very standard language. Lastly, OMH has changed their contracting guidance slightly. Uh, the previous state was that OMH, re OMH required approval from companies or vendors that wanted to provide telepsychiatry services in New York State. So now prior approval from OMH is not required before entering into such contracts, but notice of these contracts or agreements shall be provided by the distant or health site provider within 30 days after execution to the field office serving the area where the provider is located. You're now going to move on to Medicare. So for Medicare, this is the list of eligible practitioners that can provide telemedicine services. So compared to Medicaid, this is a bit of a slightly smaller list, but it obviously includes your physicians, your mid-levels, and a several other um, qualified uh, practitioners. 
So with Medicare, where the patient is located is largely dependent on um, rurality. So reimbursement at originating sites is limited to rural health professional shortage areas, non-metropolitan statistical areas, or demonstration pilots. However, within those areas, the private physician offices, hospitals, critical access hospitals, FQHCs, skilled nursing facilities, and so on are all eligible sites for the patient. Um, Section 1834M of the Social Security Act does prohibit Medicare payment for telehealth services to patients not located at these sites or in these rural areas. But we will be discussing in further slides some of the changes that were passed with the Bipartisan Budget Act of last year that will allow for reimbursement in urban areas based on certain codes and modalities. Um, and just as a side note, HRSA determines what a health professional shortage area is, and the Census Bureau determines metropolitan statistical areas. Eligible modalities under Medicare include telemedicine and store and forward, but only when it's used in federal telemedicine demonstration programs in Alaska or Hawaii. Additionally, for services that are furnished on or after January 1st, 2017, you would want to use the place of service code of 02 for telehealth. That is a CMS guideline. So some of the changes that have occurred beginning January 1st of this year stemmed from the Bipartisan Budget Act. And in that act, renal dialysis facilities, hospital-based or critical access hospital-based renal dialysis centers, and the patient's home will now be allowable originating sites for end-stage renal disease services only. An in-person visit is required once a month for the first three months and once every three months thereafter. Geographic restrictions will be waived, but none of these sites are eligible for a facility fee. And then moving on to telestroke, acute stroke services via telehealth may take place in all of the previously mentioned eligible originating sites, as well as now mobile stroke units or any location deemed appropriate by the secretary. In this case with telestroke, the home is excluded. And I didn't mention this modifier at the beginning because it is very specific, but if you are billing acute stroke services for an eligible originating site, you will want to use the modifier GO. Uh, telestroke services have characteristically been limited, which is interesting because 80% of strokes happen in the Medicare population, so this is a really positive move. The rates for telestroke codes range from $101 for G0425 up to $213 for G0508. And that is the code for a critical care telehealth consult, um, 60 minutes or more communicating with the patient or provider via telehealth. Next slide talks about how CMS chooses to add some new codes for reimbursement. So every calendar year, the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule is updated, and the decision to add new codes depends on whether the services fall into one or two categories. There's category one, which are services that are similar or currently on the list of existing telehealth services. And then category two are services that are not similar to those on the current list of telehealth services. So for 2019, CMS added the, the following two codes, which are HCPCS codes G0513 and G0514. When billing these codes, they are subject to rurality restrictions, so they could only be billed to patients in rural HIPSAs or non-MSAs. And then lastly, the originating site facility fee that I've mentioned several times, the Q3014 code, for 2019, that reimbursement rate will be $26.15. That fee usually increases every year with the Medicare Economic Index. Next up, chronic care management codes. These are not called telehealth services. So these are codes that were added for remote physiological monitoring. Previously, CMS had created a new chronic care management code, which was 99091. Keep in mind that New York State Department of Health Medicaid wants you to bill that for RPM. But for CMS, these following three codes have been released. And FQHCs and rural health clinics are allowed to bill for chronic care management. 
So these codes are 99453, which carry the reimbursement rate of $19 to $21 per setup. This is the code you would bill for the initial setup and patient education on the use of remote patient monitoring equipment. Code 99454 carries a reimbursement rate of $64 to $69 per patient per month. This is the code where you would be reviewing the daily recording or programmed alerts every 30 days. Lastly, code 99457 carries a reimbursement rate of $52 to $54 per patient per month. And this is where 20 minutes or more of qualified healthcare professional time is spent interacting with the patient and or caregiver during a So next up, these are exciting codes. Um, the virtual check-in and store and forward codes as well as the interprofessional internet consultation codes. The following codes are services furnished remotely using communications technology and are not considered Medicare telehealth services. So this is exciting because the following codes I'm about to talk about are not subject to the rurality restrictions. So first up, technology-based service, which is code G2012. So this is your synchronous real. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm just gonna go over this slide again really quickly. I apologize. Um, we were talking about the virtual check-in and store and forward codes that CMS has adopted. For the store and forward code, that is G2010, and that needs to be a patient-generated video and or image. And it needs to be an established patient where they provide verbal or written consent with each check-in and are made aware that they may be financially liable for sharing in the cost of these services. Of course, like the G2012, it cannot originate from an E&M visit seven days prior, nor result in a new visit within 24 hours. The provider interpretation and follow-up needs to be done within 24 hours, but it can be communicated through any method, including a phone call, audio or video communication, secure text messaging or email, or patient portal communication. This code carries a reimbursement rate of $13 per visit. Next up, we have our interprofessional internet consult codes. These codes all require verbal consent. Cost sharing with the patient needs to be disclosed where necessary, and it can be done via internet or phone. Of course, only practitioners who are eligible to bill Medicare for e &M visits can bill all of these codes. So these codes range from 99451 and 99452 to 99446 through 99449. And the difference in those codes is um, basically the time domain spent with consultative discussion and review. Reimbursement for these codes varies between $18 and $73. All right, so some federally qualified health center or rural health clinic changes with CMS. So both the virtual check-in and remote evaluation codes that I just discussed will be billed by an FQHC or rural health clinic as code G0071. That is set at the average of the national non-facility physician fee schedule payment rate and is updated annually. Services must be furnished by a federally qualified health center or rural health clinic practitioner to a patient who has had a billable visit within the previous year. For G0071, coinsurance and deductibles will apply. And for federally qualified health centers, it's just the patient's coinsurance. This cost sharing for this code and the previously described codes cannot be waived as CMS has no statutory authority to do so. And I might have reiterated, reiterated this earlier, but federally qualified health centers and rural health clinics are not able to use the previously discussed interprofessional internet consult codes. There were numerous comments proposed citing that these facility types should be able to function as distance sites for telehealth. Now keep in mind that for New York State Medicaid, this is now an option. However, for Medicare, per the Social Security Act, they can only serve as originating sites for qualified services. CMS does not have the authority to change this. It would take an act of Congress to make FQHCs and RHCs able to bill as distant sites. 
for Medicare Advantage plans beginning January 1st of next year, they will have the flexibility to add telehealth services as part of their core benefits. These plans have the liberty to decide what services can be offered so long as they're covered under Medicare Part B and meet some of the requirements that are listed on the slide. If additional telehealth services are not covered on, under Part B, the plan has the liberty to offer these services to their patients, but it will have to more than likely be covered by a supplemental plan. It is not mandatory for Medicare Advantage plans to cover more services beyond what's required in fee-for-service. Patients who elect to receive the benefit may pay for it with higher premiums, additional co-pays, or from the plan's rebates. Additionally, as part of the Bipartisan Budget Act, all Medicare two-sided accountable care organizations will have the flexibility come January 1st, 2020, to use telehealth in urban areas and the patient's home. So now we're gonna talk about third-party payers. So keep in mind that sometimes telehealth and telemedicine are used in different formats. And your best bet at the end of the day is to reach out to your provider relations representative if you have additional questions. The information on these slides was obtained largely from the payers' websites or from my contacts at some of the payers. All of these services are subject to the member's contract benefits and should be verified prior to rendering services. So for Blue Shield of Northeastern New York, um, effective January 1st, 2016, that was the date that New York State passed the telehealth parity law. Telehealth services are considered a coverable, coverable benefit for all lines of business with no pre-authorization required. This is going to be pretty standard across all the payers that you're gonna see um, on the following slides. With the New York State telehealth parity law, it is now a requirement that a payer cover services that are offered by a telehealth or telemedicine to the same extent that they would cover them in person. It doesn't have to be the same rate, but it does have to be covered. Additionally, Blue Shield does offer direct-to-consumer telemedicine services through their commercial members via the Doctor On Demand app. And that's your mobile health or mHealth application. Next up for Excellus. So Excellus defines originating and distance sites um, almost the same way that DOH has chosen to with their new guidance. Um, an originating site can include a private uh, physician office, hospital, clinic, skilled nursing facility, or the patient's home located in New York State or other temporary location. So this follows very closely with DOH guidance, but remember it's in accordance with the member's individual contract. Excellus chooses to reimburse the following services for telemedicine. That includes consultations, inpatient consultations, office visits, skilled nursing facility or hospital services. Um, it is limited to one telehealth visit every three days, individual psychotherapy or psychiatric diagnostic interview exams, pharmacologic management, and individual and group nutrition and diabetes self-management services. It's a pretty comprehensive list. For store and forward technology, um, they do reimburse for this. They just have some general guidelines on here. I'm not going to read them word for word, but it's basically um, items such as clear audio and visual communication. The clinical evaluation needs to be communicated back to the patient within the same business day. Um, it needs to involve a healthcare professional at the patient site, basically a telepresenter who initiates and manages the service, so on and so forth. And then lastly, the following services are medically appropriate for remote patient monitoring reimbursement with Excellus. So if the patient is in their home or work site, uh, remote patient monitoring is reimbursed so long as there are arrangements for handling emergency situations locally. Telemonitoring home care services, including equipment and related professional services, such as training the patient on how to use the equipment, the data interpretation, and patient consults, are considered not medically necessary for commercial and Medicare Advantage plans. However, this is a covered benefit for Medicaid managed care. Excellus has some additional billing guidelines, which include the 95 modifier, which we've talked about, which indicates synchronous telemedicine services. But again, that is only for the codes listed in Appendix P of the CPT code manual. 
They also have added in the GT modifier, GQ modifier, and GO for Telstroke services. Next up, we have Fidelis. So Fidelis Care at Home does recognize telehealth as a covered service, and they have a very comprehensive list of valid telehealth providers for Fidelis Care at Home. This list um, almost mirrors that of New York State Medicaid, so I won't read through all of that. For Fidelis Medicare Advantage plans without Rx, certain telehealth services including consultation, diagnosis, and treatment by a physician or practitioner for patients in certain rural areas or other locations approved by Medicare are covered. So that follows very closely with CMS guidelines. For TRICARE, TRICARE does cover the use of telemedicine technology when appropriate and medically necessary for consults, office visits, telemental health services, and stage renal disease services. And with any behavioral health care received from a TRICARE network provider, if you're an active duty service member, you would need a referral before getting care under that benefit. TRICARE Prime active duty family members and retirees, however, do not need that same referral or authorization. For Aetna, Aetna uses Teladoc as their direct-to-consumer platform and the cost will never be more than $40 for general visits. However, behavioral health and dermatology appointments may cost more. Aetna does consider home spirometry and telespirometry medically necessary for lung transplant recipients. And they also consider outpatient cardiac rehabilitation medically necessary based on certain selection criteria outlined on their website. So for their high-risk members that fall into this bracket, they will cover 36 sessions of supervised exercise with continuous telemetry monitoring. For MVP, MVP, um, what I was able to find was that they offer a direct-to-consumer option through what's called My Visit Now, and that is through a company called American Well, which many of us are familiar with. And they cover urgent care and behavioral health. And what's nice is they also cover ancillary services such as nutrition and lactation consultations. And this is a benefit that is available to essentially all of their plans. They also state that if a participating MVP, MVP provider offers covered services using telehealth, MVP will not deny the covered service because they are delivered, it's delivered using telehealth. So that falls in line with the New York State parity law. For Emblem Health, Emblem Health uses Teladoc for their direct-to-consumer plan, and that is available to individual and family plans, small business, and large group employer or business health plans. For some additional plans listed on the second bullet, those particular programs use the American Well app. If you are an Emblem Health member who is a dual eligible or enrolled in a Medicaid plan, you can access telehealth services from an approved home health care agency, so long as you're properly assessed by said agency and have a condition that requires frequent monitoring or be at risk of acute or long-term care admission. So CHF, asthma, cardiac conditions, COPD, diabetes, HIV are all valid conditions. The home health care agency must submit a doctor's order to Emblem Health along with the member's assessment in order to obtain prior approval to get these services. They need to be an adjunct to nursing care and prior authorization, of course, is required and it will only be covered if it's deemed medically necessary. Authorization is given in 30 day increments and the home health care agency in this instance would want to bill HC PCS code T1 014 for either the nursing visit or the installation of equipment, but not for both. And then the last payer I'm going to talk about is CDPHP. So they offer direct to consumer telemedicine to their commercial populations through doctor on demand. For their commercial lines of business, they allow their providers to bill per their policy for telehealth, which follows state regulations, um, also known as the parity law. Specific reimbursement rates is limited to individual provider contracts, and that is considered confidential information. So you would want to reach out to your provider relations rep to uh, get more information specifically about codes and what's reimbursed or not. Participating telemedicine providers can bill for their services with the place of service code of 02 and with an appropriate E&M code in the ranges that are listed on this slide. 
for select HARP and Child Health Plus plans, patient sites are limited to Article 28 and 40 facilities, private physician offices, or when a patient is receiving healthcare services by means of RPM in their home. For those same plans, the select HARP and Child Health Plus plans, providers performing telemedicine services need to be participating with CDPHT and are limited to this list. And limited to, I think this is a very comprehensive list, it mirrors that of the New York State Medicaid DOH update. And then lastly, the distance site provider for these select HARP and Child Health Plus plans need to submit their claims with the appropriate code and then either the GT or 95 modifier and a place of service code of 02. Originating site providers will be reimbursed the Q3014 code and they need to make sure that if the originating site is a facility, services must be submitted under an outpatient bill type with revenue code 0780 and the Q3014 code. At this time, CDPHP does not cover the interprofessional internet consult codes, but their policies are meant to follow laws and regulations and they are looking to simplify those policies. So we're now going to move on to questions. Yeah, um, I wanna go back real quickly. Mm -hmm. um, when we lost sound, we had a couple people ask about the G2012 code. Okay. Can you just refresh on that before we get into questions? Absolutely. So we're just going to touch really quickly on the G2012 code since I cut out there for a few minutes. So the G2012 code is newly added and is not subject to the 1834M rurality restrictions, meaning that patients in urban areas can initiate these visits and providers can bill and be reimbursed for them. So the G2012 code is called basically called the virtual check-in code, and that is a synchronous real-time check-in lasting five to 10 minutes. It can be done over the telephone. It needs to be patient-initiated, though, and the patient has to be established with the provider. There needs to be verbal consent at each check-in, and the patient needs to be made aware that as a beneficiary, they may be financially liable for sharing in the cost of these services. This code cannot originate from an E&M visit seven days prior, nor result in a new visit within 24 hours of the check-in. There is no frequency limit on the use of this code. However, CMS will be monitoring utilization, and there are no service-specific documentation requirements for this code. It carries a reimbursement rate of $15 per visit. Okay, so I'm gonna start from the back and go down. So will OASAS reimburse telepsychiatry outside of their licensed clinics? Um, so OASAS calls it telepractice. I want to just make sure that that's clear that each agency does have a different term. Um, OASAS, as I understand it right now, reimburses for telepractice um, with Article 32 clinics. Okay. And why is DOH refusing to cover telehealth for dual eligible patients? Um, DOH is not refusing to cover telehealth for dual eligible patients. I'm going to go back to that exact slide. So um, and I'm going to go back to it on my own. Just give me a second to find it. So for dual eligible patients, if Medicare covers the telehealth service, then Medicaid will reimburse the patient's Part B coinsurance and or deductible. However, if Medicare denies the service, then Medicaid is choosing to follow suit. Um, so it's not necessarily a refusal. They just follow along with what Medicare guidelines state. Okay. Why is OASAS requiring that a DEA registered clinician be physically present for the MAT evaluation when DEA has already published that they don't require this? Yeah, so I get this question a lot. Um, that question has been posed to OASAS and I am awaiting a response. Um, I do not have a concrete answer to that. I sympathize with you, um, but stay tuned that I'm working on getting an answer to that. Okay. Um, you go to the next one. So uh, CASAC, these are so, your things, so not mine. KSACs, KSACs under OASAS are permitted to offer. However, it is still correct that Medicaid and Medicaid managed care will not yet pay for telehealth service performed by this provider type. Um, I, I don't believe that to be correct. The new DOH update for telehealth is a finalized document, and in it, it says that KSACs certified and credentialed by OASAS are eligible providers of telehealth services. Therefore, they should be 
um, receiving reimbursement if they bill for Medicaid fee for service. Can you clarify regarding the use of uh, modifier 25? Are you saying that for telehealth, two EM yeah. services can be performed by the same provider patient on the same day? So with the 25 modifier, if and I, and I did go over this because this question was asked um, previous to this uh, session. So the 25 modifier is for an in-person visit. So what happens if there's two telemedicine visits for one patient on the same day? The take on the guidance is that this modifier is meant to be um, submitted for an unrelated in-person service that was conducted in addition to the telehealth service. So if you saw a patient via telehealth and then three hours later they were seen in person, that in-person service is where you would append the 25 modifier. So if there are two different telehealth services for the same patient on the same day, you would not use the 25 modifier. You would just simply bill each distinct telehealth services separately. Okay. OPWDD policy on requiring RNs to direct support staff as it relates to medication and simple directions flies so this is an OPWDD question. We have not seen their administrative directive memo, so I can't comment on questions related to OPWDD until I see that guidance. Okay. Um, this was on slide 13. Okay. I checked that, but how is the substantial ongoing relationship defined? Uh, so I would imagine it's not, again, it's not up to me to interpret guidance, but a substantial ongoing relationship, I would imagine that it's a patient that a provider sees. Um, at least more than once in the prior year. I know with some of the CMS codes, they require that there's at least one billable visit in the last year. But from what I've seen in, in all guidance, there's nothing really defining a substantial ongoing relationship. Okay. If FQHC opted out of APG, they can bill both the originating and distance site if part of the same billing entity? Question mark. Um, for FQHCs, that have opted out of APGs, can they bill both originating and distance site as part of the same billing entity? Um, I'm referring back to the FQHC slide. So, just give me a second, I'm just looking through it. So how that would work, it says that when services are provided via telemedicine to a patient located at an FQHC originating site, that originating site can bill the offsite services rate code 4012 to recoup administrative expenses associated with the encounter. So I hope that answers your question. All right, and you just kind of hit on this. So can an FQHC bill PPS rate for the distance site and rate code 4012 for the originating site if both sites are part of the same FQHC for the same visit? Um, I, I'm not going to answer a lot of the same questions. You'll want to refer to the guidance that's attached on this webinar. We have about three minutes, so we can answer a few more questions. I just want to clarify that if I don't get to your question today, I will get a report of the questions back to me. But if you don't hear from me in the next week or you want to talk offline, um, my email is right on the slide here. Most of you know my phone number, so don't hesitate to reach out and um, I can find the answer for you or put you in connection with the right person. Um, Christine, yes, this is being recorded. Yeah. So you will get of your course. answers on there. Um, I'm trying to see if there's anything you want to grab through real quick. Um, so uh, one of the questions is if there's any specific language regarding demonstration pilots for Medicare requirements. Not to my knowledge. Um, I, I have not seen that. I'm going to hit these real quick just because these will disappear. Mm -hmm. um, regarding an FQHC, when a provider is on site answering a telemedicine call from patient, what is the reimbursement rate for the service? Will we get the PPS rate as well? And is there a difference when the patient calls from home versus on site? The individual reimbursement rates for different CPT codes and E&M services, that you're only going to know that when you bill. I don't have access to that information. I don't work in a healthcare facility with with billers, so it's tough to answer that question. The reimbursement rate for that, if an FQHC is acting as a distance site, if you're not opted into APGs, you bill the PPS rate. 
Um, I don't believe there would be a difference whether or not the patient is in a home or a clinic or where they're located. That rate would be the same regardless of where the patient is located. Um, what dental services are eligible for reimbursement when provided through telehealth and is a new patient exam covered? Uh, th there was actually no guidance about dental services in the new DOH update, I just know that dentists are eligible providers. So that would be a question you'd want to direct to me offline that I can follow up with. Um, we are at 1.59 p.m., so I am going to cap it now. There are a lot more questions, so I will do my best to sort through those, um, maybe create a document that kind of summarizes everything and send that out to all of you. This session has been recorded and the slide deck as well as the recording will be going out later this week, early next week. So I thank you for bearing with our technical difficulties. I really appreciate everybody who took the time to be on the line. And I, I hope that, that this session was valuable to you and don't hesitate to reach out with additional questions should you have them. Have a wonderful rest of your week, everyone, and thank you.